so Dirty Kanza is officially upon us. It's less than two weeks away. In fact, this Friday, Laura and I are hopping in our van and driving to Kansas uh, to ride the event. DK has always been an event that's fascinated us. It started from very humble beginnings and it has now grown into an international event. And it's really changed the town of Emporia, Kansas. Over the years, we've seen epic pictures and ride narratives from the riders conquering the course. But in this episode of PLP Talks, I really wanted to focus on a story that really doesn't get a whole lot of attention. And that's what Dirty Kanza, the event, has done for the town of Emporia. And also how Dirty Kanza truly is a community event. So in this very special episode of PLP Talks, we get to interview Jim Cummins, the ride director of Dirty Kanza, as well as Casey Woods, who is the executive director of the Emporia Main Street program. And we're going to focus on the interesting relationship between this gravel event that seemed crazy at first and how the town has come to embrace it. But before we jump right in, this episode, like all the other episodes, is supported by viewers and listeners just like you guys. So if you enjoy this episode or have enjoyed episodes in the past, consider supporting the channel and this series. I'm going to have some links in the YouTube description below or in the YouTube show notes. And once again, this is all made possible by you guys. We are not raking in massive ad dollars, so every bit helps. And just as a side note for you guys watching it on YouTube, this is going to be truly a podcast. Uh, I recorded this interview a couple months ago and only did the audio. So with all that housekeeping aside, put on those earbuds, pretend like you are working at your desk. We won't tell, promise, and enjoy the show. Uh, Dirty Kanza is, uh, in its most basic basic form, is... uh... Uh, ultra distance uh, gravel road cycling challenge uh, is held in, in Emporia, Kansas. Uh, Emporia is the front porch of the Flint Hills. Uh, the Flint Hills, um, uh, I believe it's correct in saying uh, they are uh, the last remaining tract of natural tall grass prairie in North America. Uh, it's just a vast expanse of natural tall grass prairie. Um, uh, rolling green hills as far as the eye can see, a very remote and rugged place and we think uh, the perfect place uh, to hold a cycling uh, challenge on gravel. So from from the beginning was there a relationship between the event and downtown? Uh, Not originally. Uh, The first Dirty Kansas 200 was held in 2006 and it was little more than just a group ride. Uh, We had 34 riders. Uh, We started and finished in a hotel parking lot and uh, you know the scoring consisted of one person underneath a 10-foot awning with a clipboard and a pencil uh, recording people as they came back, uh, and uh, and that's basically what it was actually for the first uh, few years. Um, people in town, for the most part, didn't even know the event was happening. Uh, I believe uh, it was 2010 when year four. Uh, year four when we first took it downtown and uh, by that time I had brought uh, Christy and Tim Moan on board as my partners in crime so to speak and uh, it was Christy's idea uh, to move the start finish downtown and to get Emporia Main Street involved in in helping put this thing on and take it to the next level. Well so how did that initial relationship between um, Emporia Main Street and DK come about? And what was the response when, when you guys asked Main Street to, to get involved? Well, Christy was on our board of directors, and she was also um, a volunteer, and she might have been on the board of the Granada Theater uh, as well in the downtown area. And uh, frankly, she asked everybody in the entire community <laughs> to get involved. But most people said, you want to do what? <laughs> and it was a strange concept um, that... Uh, you know, people riding 200 miles through the Flint Hills and uh, Flint and its effect on tires and uh, just knowing what that does to your body um, uh, riding out there seemed strange. And then, OK, now we're going to have a finish line. where People are riding 30 miles an hour down a state highway into a crowd of people seemed a, a little weird. And so I, I'm not sure she got a lot of traction right away, but um, Main Street uh, often says, well, let's try it. 
and we had block parties that we had done before. We've got Emporia State University on the edge of our downtown, so we have welcome back sort of events, and we have a, a huge festival called the Great American Market, and um, all of us were looking for an excuse to try and have a beer garden outside, and so we, we wanted to try some different things during the summer. The Granada Theater, Jessica Buckholz was a brand new director, and she was also very open-minded at trying new things. So we said, let's give it a shot and see if we can make um, this relationship work. And I don't think any of us, uh, with 250 people, I think that first year it was downtown, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and a beer garden that was uh, five outfield fence panels that were strung together. <laughs> I don't think any of us imagined it would uh, turn into this international beast but that's where good ideas come from. It was a, we believed in Christy. Um, we had assisted at that time, Christy and Tim had Flint Hills Music, a downtown business. We knew that they had a track record of being able to work collaboratively and, and we were willing to help. Was there a lot of initial skepticism? There was skepticism in some elements of the community. Uh, there were, were some people within the community that had identified the Flint Hills as a, a tremendous natural resource, but people had a hard time understanding how people could interact with that uh, without damaging it. And um, so we viewed, uh, and those individuals viewed, this as an opportunity uh, to get people out and experience what's been called one of the top 15 uh, sunsets in the world and this really unique uh, ecosystem. The people that, that didn't um, see uh, what, what this uh, could potentially be, um, there were you know, safety questions, there were, would anybody show up to watch people finish a bike race? You know, this I've never heard of uh, an event that was quite like this. So um, there, there are some people in every community that says, well, if I haven't seen something exactly like it in a community 50 miles from, from us, then it must not work. And um, so it's hard for some individuals to wrap their mind around new concepts and trying some, some different things. But um, those people uh, basically said, you know, it's, it's your head if the thing gets out. <laughs> we said, okay, well, we're going to try it anyway, and uh, we're, we're glad we did. Yeah, and I think all this uh, speaks to uh, uh, Christy Moan's uh, persuasiveness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, good word for it. And, um, and also uh, the, uh, the confidence and the trust that uh, many people in this community have in her. Uh, she is a very, uh, very much a big picture thinker. And um, uh, I know that I personally have have learned that uh, uh, when Christy comes up with a, a, a new idea, uh, it's, it's in a person's best interest to at least uh, consider the possibilities. She's us she is usually right. So that was kind of the the before picture. How has the reception changed? Well, uh, from a community standpoint, and you, uh, I, I'd say the writer standpoint is something that Jim uh, mm -hmm. can definitely address a little better than I can. But from the community standpoint, it's something that people circle on their calendar for all year. And uh, there are businesses that have rebranded themselves as, uh, you know, we have a coffee shop that's now Gravel City Roasters. Um, we have a uh, craft beer uh, bar that's downtown that their their motto is uh, ride, ride bike straight beer. And, <laughs> uh, and we have a lot of businesses that have sprung up. Um, we had one small uh, bike shop when uh, the Dirty Kansas started. We now have three uh, in the downtown area and they're all busy. Uh, we have a lot of restaurants and a variety of different businesses that just plan on seeing um, uh, trucks and cars with these funny little bike racks on their back uh, all year round as people are uh, getting out in the Flint Hills and practicing. And then the the day of uh, the Dirty Kanza or the, the few days around Dirty Kanza, every single hotel room is full. We fill Emporia State University's dorms. There are a lot of people that host people in their houses. Uh, our population, uh, because college is in, in session, goes up by several percentage points. Um, so it's it's cool to see uh, seven or eight thousand people de descend on uh, downtown. Yeah, and with, as far as uh, the riders, um, our riders tell us uh, that uh, they're made to feel like rock stars when they come to town. Uh, the reception that, that they receive uh, when they first arrive, and then throughout their entire stay in Emporia, 
uh, means as much to them as the experience that they have just from the ride itself. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, they come to, to uh, Emporia uh, to ride Dirty Kanza, but oftentimes they return year after year because of the reception that they get from this community. Let's talk a little bit about the um, kind of the economic benefits. Have you guys been able to, to capture that or, or quantify that? We, we, it's a little difficult, but there are elements that we can quantify. We can definitely look at uh, hotel stays and um, we can uh, make some assumptions about uh, people spending um, for the event itself. The, the thing that I think is a, that's important to remember about the Dirty Kansas, though, even though it's a singular event, people ride the Flint Hills all year long because of the event. And um, it's done some things that are uh, a little difficult to quantify um, in terms of economics, but the community weight loss we've talked about and <laughs> um, how much healthier the community has gotten, the brand awareness of Emporia, uh, the fact that we have businesses that, uh, because we're a college town, used to lay off employees during the summer, and they don't do that now because they have this massive event and a, a lot of writers coming into town that keep their sales up. And we've seen housing develop uh, in the downtown area. We've seen new businesses start. We've seen existing businesses expand. So we're talking in the millions of dollars on a yearly basis that this event uh, has provided an economic and branding boost for our community. Yeah, it, it must feel pretty wild to have like national bike brands build product specifically for an event in your town yeah that uh that's uh, almost hard to get your mind around i, I watched all the videos that uh, you guys have on dirty cancer productions and, and gravel guru and i was struck by one i forget which presentation it was but you were talking about um kind of the importance of working with local ranchers and that they were kind of essential to the success can you talk speak a little bit more about that absolutely um well, like I said earlier, the Flint Hills is this vast expanse of natural tall grass prairie. What that means is it's probably the best place in the entire world to raise cattle. Uh, so um, uh, we're out there riding these gravel roads uh, going past uh, all these ranches. And uh, uh, yes, they're public access roads, uh, but the reality is uh, we're playing in someone else's front yard. And uh, Dirty Kanza very much believes in, in uh, uh, our responsibility to be good neighbors. And uh, uh, we want to have a, a strong relationship with uh, the landowners out there. And um, so, uh, you know, we, uh, we just take that relationship very, very uh, uh, strongly. Um, uh, you know, middle-aged white men in Lycra are a very strange sight to a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, 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 it's new to them, it's odd to them, and uh, we just uh, you know, spent a lot of effort in just trying to, to help them understand uh, uh, what Dirty Kansas is about uh, and uh, uh, how Dirty Kansas uh, um, uh, positively impacts uh, the greater community. And the relationship has changed, I think, from, oh, absolutely. from when it began. And now you have a lot of ranchers and people in small towns that really buy into this because as checkpoints, right. these ag towns um, really see another economic boom. And then after the Dirty Kansas, uh, uh, Jim and his crew uh, did something really intelligent. They run a clean Kansas uh, event where they leave the course and beyond the Flint Hills better than what they found them. Uh, and then that's one of uh, the things that I enjoy participating mm -hmm. in when I have the opportunity, um, because the day of I'm a little busy with other, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a beautiful event and it gives, uh, people buy into, um, supporting the maintenance of this, of this gorgeous area. Yeah. So we, we cover, uh, every, every inch of the 200 miles of, of the course, uh, plus some, and, uh, we send, uh, groups of two, uh, out into the Flint Hills with uh, trash bags, <laughs> and uh, they pick up uh, every speck of trash up, up along, you know, up and down along the, the ditches of these gravel roads, and uh, it's it's a really cool thing. And and the ranchers 
uh, obviously they, they they really respect that effort and and they come out and help us with it as well so it's, it's a great uh, great way to see those two communities coming together do you see i mean it probably wasn't the intent but dirty cans uh, you know kind of almost functioning as like ad- advocacy for bikes in the region Almost definitely, yeah. And and you're right. It, it was never the intent. I mean, Joel and I were just putting on a group ride when we created this thing, and uh, to see what it's become is uh, is uh, kind of mind boggling still. But uh, but but yes, uh, I think there's a lot of eyes on Dirty Cans in many different ways, and so we we do feel that we've uh, got you know we have an obligation to be uh, role models in in various different aspects. You can see how the community and people in the area have reacted uh, before Dirty Kanza. Bike lanes weren't a thing here. Um, we didn't have bike racks, hardly any place. We didn't have bike repair stations. Uh, people didn't know how to interact with riders on the road and certainly not on the gravel roads. And now there's been this, this etiquette and people know how to react one another and I'm not saying that nothing ever happens but I, I think there's a, a general mutual respect um, out there and now when we talk about development in Emporia bike accessibility uh, is part of that discussion and the, the fact that um, in Emporia Kansas we can uh, have the discussions about where are people going to park their bikes um, and how are they going to bike from point A to point B is just light years ahead of where we were from a planning standpoint prior to the DK. Well, I'm kind of curious about um, a kind of other probably unintentional benefit of getting the community healthier. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you saw that happen? Well, I think that's just a natural extension of uh, people being on bikes. Uh, but uh, the the way that we try to give back to the community uh, as, as an extension of Dirty Kansas, uh, I think we uh, we we either gave and in, directly in donations or in, in uh, by way of uh, creating uh, fundraising opportunities for. Uh, for various organizations uh, to the tune of about $30,000 last year. Uh, uh, we uh, support uh, Emporia State University via scholarship programs. Uh, we uh, 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 raise funds for uh, an organization called the Never Let Go Fund, which uh, uh, serves uh, local, com- uh, local families uh, uh, battling childhood cancer. Uh, we support uh, SOS, uh, uh, just all kinds of uh, uh, different organizations, school districts, uh, church youth groups, uh, all these group, uh, all these organizations have an opportunity to, to uh, uh, get engaged with Dirty Kansas and create fundraising opportunities uh, through Dirty Kansas. Well, we've seen a lot of people, um, there are business owners downtown that can jump on group rides now and um, they... Uh, Mulready's Pub, Rick Becker would be a good example of somebody that probably lost over 100 pounds um, as he was riding bikes. And uh, there's a lot of that here. And then when we look at things like the finish line party, uh, there are a lot of organizations that will come in and they'll make four or $5,000 that day um, by selling food or different things. They wouldn't have that fundraising opportunity if not for uh, the Dirty Kings and what that brought in uh, to the community. There are retailers that, um, you know, years ago, that first week in June, college is out of session, it's slower in town, and, and that would be a rough month. And we well, had a retailer um, last year say, you know, I did about $90,000 in a three-day period. And that's, that's a really good um, sort of uh, economic benefit uh, that probably doesn't show up within the direct um, sort of donations that Jim was talking about, but there's definitely an indirect benefit. And uh, I think there's something to say for community pride in that you experience your community and the Flint Hills differently on a bike. There's an appreciation there because when you're in a car, it's point A to point B. I'm just looking at the road, slowing it down a little bit um, and experiencing the sights, the sounds, and different things. You just appreciate the natural beauty of your community a little more and it becomes of a social hangout um, after a ride 
um, when, when people get in that has really changed the cultural dynamic in the community. That's cool. So it's something it's it's a it's a new appreciation for the place from from the residents as well as like visiting writers. Yes. Yeah. You know, a lot of people who grew up here, uh, I, I grew up in a town not far from here and, and uh, my whole youth was uh, spent uh, thinking about where I was going to move to. Uh, there's people now who choose to move to Emporia uh, because of the cycling opportunities that are here. So uh, that's really cool to see. It's fun to see people run up to somebody in an airport because they're wearing dirty Kansas apparel and say, I'm from Emporia, and then an awkward sort of conversation. <laughs> and explain, oh, and, you know, I didn't mean to assault you, but that, that's our race. And uh, they, they get really proud of their town. And Midwestern um, pride in small communities is something that has waned o- over the years in a lot of different places. But... Um, when people could take ownership of that, it was, I'm not going to move away. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to invest here and you should come back. Um, a lot of former Emporians have come back and, and then they become advocates uh, for the community. Uh, every time we, uh, have the dirty cans, of launch video, uh, mm-hmm. that gets like 80,000 views and everybody's talking about that's my hometown. Even if they haven't lived here in 30 years, that's my hometown. And uh, it does wonders uh, for our community psyche and our opportunities. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by the the fact that, you know, Dirty Kansas is, you know, a one-time event, but there are people that are coming year-round to, to practice and ride there. When, when did you guys start seeing that phenomenon? Was that fairly early on? And is there, did, did it just naturally happen, or were there things that you guys did to make it kind of a year-round cycling destination? It's, uh, I think it's happened uh, uh, just here in the last couple of years, actually, to, to where we really started seeing a, a dramatic increase in the number of people who were coming here uh, year round uh, to ride. But today, you can walk up and down Commercial Street on any given weekend year round, and you'll see, uh, you know, out of state license plates with uh, bike racks, and, you know, people have driven here. Uh, parked on on Commercial Street, which is our main street, uh, unloaded her bike and gone out in the Flint Hills and, and rode. And uh, and that obviously, you know, adds to this economic impact that we're talking about. It's, it's not just a, the impact that comes Dirty Kansas a weekend. It's these people who come back to um, Emporia, uh, you know, weekend after weekend to ride their bikes. And then when they get done riding, you know, they're going into our restaurants, going into our pubs. Uh, uh, there's oftentimes uh, a, a rider will come here to ride and, and will bring a spouse. And the spouse spends the day shopping while while the other is, is out riding. So Kids will go to the zoo. Kid, yeah, they'll go, they'll go replace part. a derailleur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they go into the bike shop and replace parts and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. Emporia and the Flint Hills have uh, become a preferred cycling vacation destination. And I think part of it is you can't simulate it. Um, So there are a lot of people that uh, the first time they experience Kansas wind, they realize that they are not from a windy place. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time they have to pedal downhill, (laughs) it kind of freaks them out a little bit. And um, the fact that a lot of riders are used to pavement and there's just, it's, it's just different. And um, smart riders know if they're going to go out and ride 200 miles, you know, your equipment, nutrition are, are critical, but you've got to experience it. You don't want that to be the day before. And I, I'm out on the Flint Hills for the first time. Um, we've had some people try that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't always work out real well, but it's a, it's a good opportunity. And then once people do that, um, if, if they drop out, we have a lot of people that say, no, I'm going to finish it. And they'll go to their drop um, spot and then they'll ride back or they'll say, that was just so gorgeous. I got to do it again. And they'll just take a more leisurely ride through the Flint Hills and enjoy it. I think a couple of years ago, Dirty Kansas was on the cover of uh, like the Kansas State Tourism magazine. Like when did the, the state tourism start? taking notice? Well, it would have been uh, several years ago. I mean, uh, we're very, very uh, proud of the fact that in 2015, uh, Dirty Kansas was uh, uh, honored uh, with the Governor's Tourism Award for the impact uh, that we've had on the on tourism in the state. 
Uh, so I think we've certainly been on the radar for some time. Um, and we work with them uh, on a fairly frequent basis to uh, on various initiatives to try to drive uh, cycling-based tourism to the state. So, um, yeah, we have a really good relationship with them. Yeah. In fact, uh, the governor himself uh, requested that we create a new event, which, which we did last year. Um, uh, they've been, uh, for the last decade, there's been a lot of uh, work going into developing a hundred mile long stretch of converted railroad bed to a multi-use trail. Uh, that grand opening, uh, and it's called the Flint Hills Nature Trail, by the way, and the grand opening of the Flint Hills Nature Trail uh, was just this past October. And uh, at the request of uh, Governor Brownback, uh, Dirty Kansas Promotions uh, created a new event called uh, Rush the Rails. And it was a, uh, a hundred mile uh, relay run and a Grand Fondo style uh, bike ride uh, down the entire length of that trail, uh, culminating with a huge finish line festival in the town of Council Grove. And uh, uh, that's gonna become an annual event for us and one that will continue working with uh, Kansas Department of Tourism to uh, try to um, make people aware of the wonderful cycling opportunities that are here in Kansas. How do you keep the event fresh? Uh, that's a constant struggle. Yeah. And um, uh, a lot of, well, you know, there's various things. I mean, you know, we change the course up every few years. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, look for new initiatives like, you know, last year was our 200 women riding 200 miles initiative where we're trying to get more women involved. Um, uh, expansion of our expo this year. Uh, it'll be a two-day expo instead of a one-day expo. Uh, we're opening up the expo um, where before it was uh, only event sponsors were allowed to uh, display in the expo. Now uh, anybody uh, in the cycling and outdoor recreation industry will be able to um, uh, participate in our expo. Um, uh, we've uh, added uh, two uh, new events to the Dirty Kansas Weekend this year. Uh, we've added a high school uh, championship event, um, and uh, that's part of our overall efforts to establish a youth cycling league here in Kansas. And uh, then we've also added what we're calling a DKXL. It's our mega distance event uh, that we're going to pilot in 2018 with the hopes of taking this thing larger in 2019. It's a 350 mile course, a uh, totally rider self-supported type of event. So, and from the community standpoint, we're always looking for ways to expand uh, the finish line party. We added uh, a kids zone uh, that was very family friendly um, last year that was dedicated uh, to, to just uh, kind of families and they had their own little, little uh, DK bike race. So um, we're, we're getting the, that next generation of riders excited. Um, we two years ago we started a welcome wagon um event where uh riders and just city folks get out and chalk all the sidewalks uh welcoming uh dirty kansas folks we've expanded uh the finish line quite a bit um mm -hmm. and we'll we continue to add uh new elements just so that um, we can reach out to people beforehand and let them know you know as you're here and you're bringing your family these are things family can do from our aquatic center to our zoo and um, all sorts of uh, different things that they can participate in and just making sure that um, we're, we're trying to add things to show that it's a holistic event. Uh, we know that riders uh, sometimes have to make choices where they're going to go and the thing that set, uh, separates uh, the Dirty Kansas from uh, a family standpoint is there's something for everybody to do. Uh, so everybody can enjoy themselves here and I, I think that's one of the many reasons why this isn't a bucket list race. This is something that people come to once and they think it might be on their bucket list and they say, oh, I really want to do that again and I want to bring family and then uh, the rest of the family saying, well, we're doing that again next year, right? And it's it's caused, you know, the first year it was downtown, it was 250 people and now it's, it's 10 times that. Right. I know that there's a Dirty Kansas Bible for the writer. Is there an equivalent to com the community and the businesses? So, or how do you brief, you know, the, the community about what's going on? Well, um, <laughs> several different ways. Um, me, uh, Important Main Street has about 200 members, and we work very well with local media uh, to try and get information out. And we'll we'll cover uh, things uh, about how businesses can take advantage. 
Uh, this year, we're actually going above and beyond that. We're, uh, we're, we're having a Thrive and Survive workshop um, that's uh, towards the end of February, um, where we'll actually talk about this. Is, these are all the uh, ancillary events that are going on with the Dirty Kansas. This is why it's designed this way. These are ways that you can get involved either as an organization or as a business or as someplace that can provide housing or can host people um, so that everybody knows how they can uh, uh, take advantage of this situation and how they can contribute. And there are a lot of people that uh, have, have called just in the last few days that we've been promoting it that said, I just want to volunteer and uh, I want to feel like um, I'm a part of this because it's an important thing. We own um, this this event in our hearts and we, we want to help make sure that this continues to grow and expand. And so there is a lot of pre-work uh, that goes uh, to that. And that's really a testament uh, to uh, Jim and Leland and uh, Christy and Tim that they decided this was going to be more than a race. And they wanted the outreach and the communication and to get people involved and for them to, to feel like they could benefit um, from what was going on as opposed to this is just a thing that happens in your town. And uh, I, I think because of that, the advocacy uh, from the locals has just been tremendous. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a lot of people that pin their hopes and dreams on the DK and uh, it's it's a beautiful sight to see, you know, a 70 year old uh, woman walk up to somebody uh, in Commercial Street Diner and uh, say, uh, you know, oh, which length are you riding and and ask what they're riding. And they know the brands of bikes mm -hmm. and they're talking about tires and stuff, and, uh, their wheels. And it's just the coolest thing uh, to see. But that's because of all of these different communication efforts that we have before and the follow up that we have after um, so that people can say, you know, these are some things that we can continue to improve. So you guys have been doing this for some time. What what would be some lessons that that you know now that you wish you knew earlier on? <laughs> I'll let you go first. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Just stay in the corporate world, work your nine to five job, keep your head down low and just go ride your bike. <laughs> uh, so, but if you would do really do want to do this type of thing, yeah, um, uh, uh, there's no substitute for passion. That's the number one thing, I think. Uh, 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 and uh, be prepared to work long and hard uh, for very little pay. <laughs> do it because it's something that you love, uh, something that you feel called to do. You can see uh, three o'clock hit the clock three times in one event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, part of uh, part of the cool thing that we learned early on was find partners and let them do what they do. And, oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's been a brilliant thing that has carried on, uh, carried through in a variety of different initiatives uh, in Emporia that it's not, there's not the umbrella thing where uh, I've got to be the head of everything and then uh, have this uh, this oversight over every a different piece. We just have partnerships that we trust each other um, to, to do what's best for each other. We communicate and get things done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, the the other thing I, I guess I learned was, was in a conservative area. Um, there's always the uh, you know let's not try new things, and I, I think the um, entrepreneurial attitude, the uh, let's give it a shot. Um, what's the worst that could happen? Let's uh, and sometimes that does happen, <laughs> but it's a, let's give it a shot. And and um, so learning to to trust um, the opportunities. Uh, is something that if uh, uh, I could go back 10 years and kind of shake myself mm -hmm. a little bit and, and say, okay, uh, just, just trust it. You're going to be really nervous those first few years. Um, and uh, I think uh, probably the uh, other thing that uh, I wish I would have known was how complex the Kansas liquor laws are for gigantic <laughs> beer bar uh, gardens. <laughs> But uh, 
I, I think it's always a learning process every year, but that's part of the enjoyment that you get out of it. it, it if it wasn't challenging and um, there wasn't so much energy, it wouldn't be something that we want to do, but it's something that um, probably not 3 a.m. the day after or at the award ceremony when we're all exhausted, um, <laughs> you're looking forward to, but um, generally you, you just get a high that week because there's just so much energy. Um, Lycra must be slightly radioactive or something. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a good feeling to have. I'd like to echo something that uh, Casey just touched on, um, and that's the importance of surrounding yourself with good people and, um, and being, um, being free enough to allow the event to maybe go in a slightly different direction than you first thought. Uh, I would have never guessed in 2006 that Dirty Kansas was going to be what it is today. And um, part of that is uh, getting good people in the community engaged, uh, working with them and letting them uh, de determine what it, what is it that they can contribute and then trusting them and allowing them to do that. Uh, and then just kind of sitting back and watching uh, the wonderful new directions that that takes your event. Um, but, uh, um, you know, that, that goes a long way in, uh, in, uh, getting the community involved in, in, the, in the community supporting your event. Mm -hmm. How did you, let's say you're approaching a, a potential community partner, um, that might be slightly skeptical. How do you frame the event or what's the ask? It's really hard to answer because I think it's different with every with That's every right. group, uh, uh, and uh, I, I, an example might be uh, Emporia Farmers Market. You know, we we want we they wanted to get involved in what is it that they can bring to the table, uh, and uh, for several years uh, they managed our um, uh, pre race meal. Uh, you know, the meal uh, Friday night for, for the rider meeting or for the riders. Um, and uh, that actually that has kind of fallen by the wayside because, you know, the event has grown. What worked yet last year may not work uh, the following year because the event just continues to grow and morph. Um, but uh, that was one way that they were engaged for several years and uh, became their biggest annual fundraiser for many years. Um, and there, there's just any number of ways. Um, there's a, a 501c organization that exists today uh, because of Dirty Cans. I mentioned earlier the Never Let Go Fund uh, that uh, serves uh, uh, families from the community who are battling childhood cancer. Uh, that organization didn't even exist. Uh, uh, there was a, a family from here in town who uh, suffered through that type of a situation. Uh, they wanted to do something. Uh, in remembrance of their lost uh, family member, and uh, uh, they uh, provided a support group for hire service uh, one year for maybe a dozen riders. Uh, this year, they're going to serve 450 riders, and uh, they'll probably earn $20,000. Uh, so it's, it's been a marvelous thing to see. But but that is that all came from a community member who just wanted to contribute. And, and, and working with that person to brainstorm a way that, that they could do that, that, that they could be involved, involved. And it is, it's to see what it is morphed into, uh, is, is just incredible. And when we're communicating about finish line party and some of our activities, I mean, um, if we're talking to Healthier Line County or Newman Regional Health or local hospital, we can talk about the health benefits of biking. If we're talking in, uh, to the local police department that provides phenomenal security for the event, um, we can talk about bicycle safety and uh, the sort of that neighborhood um, policing um, that only is effective if uh, people can see their, their local police officers uh, out and just conversing with the community. Um, if we're talking about uh, to businesses, we can talk about business impact. If um, we're talking to people that are interested in tourism, we can show them how many people are, are coming into town. You really tailor the message to the group uh, that you're talking to. And then if you just are talking to people that love Emporia, um, you know, we actually have the iHeart Emporia merchandise that wouldn't have existed, I think, without events like the Dirty Kanza 
and uh, people say, okay, well, this is something uh, that if, if we're going to showcase our community to the rest of Kansas or the rest of the world now, um, this is something that we can lead with and people really buy uh, into that. So tailoring the message uh, to those individuals, there's always something, uh, this is such an expansive event now that there's always something that people can buy into. Is this like the currently the largest event in in town or with the largest draw or is there a bigger one? It's not the largest <laughs> event. Yeah, we have a, 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 a disc golf tournament uh, there. Um, called Last Blown Open, uh, and Casey could probably speak to it a lot better than I, but I, I think it would actually draw more people to town and, and for a longer period of time uh, than Dirty Kansas does. Yeah, it's the world's largest disc golf event, and that's another, I, I, I think that that event grew um, so quickly because a lot of people had a model that they could look to the Dirty Kansas and cross apply. We have things like um, the Great American Market um, is probably technically largest event, but one of the reasons that it grew was we've established so many relationships with booth vendors uh, that now instead of coming once a year, they're rotating through Emporia like five or six times a year, and we're on uh, their circuit. So uh, even though it's probably technically not our largest event, I'd say that it has uh, probably the largest cultural impact. Well, let's uh, wrap up a little bit, but before we do, I'm curious about what would be What's your favorite anecdote from like a community perspective? Uh, I love uh, the Friday before uh, the Dirty Kanta. I love uh, to see how many people um, that have nothing to do with the race just go hang out uh, downtown um, at, because they, they want to be, you know, like close to the riders. And um, we, we have... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, our late, uh, female population that love, love men in Lycra. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I love I love that whole Midwestern, um, the shock. Uh, the, my favorite antidote, uh, anecdote is probably the shock of a writer having somebody be so glaringly nice to them. And they're like, that, this is weird for me. Uh, and that's just who, who we are here. And um, we're this bubbly, super nice sort of community that, that people like to engage other people. And those stories um, that year after year, um, people will seek out a writer that they met at a restaurant four years ago. And those relationships, that's my favorite thing um, that, that I see. Um, little ladies that adopt writers, that's my boy. Uh, and uh, and I, I love to see that. Yeah. Uh, as I'm thinking about the, how to answer that, uh, a story comes to mind. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell this story on Dan Hughes, our four, four-time <laughs> Dirty Kansas champion. Uh, because this story kind of speaks to... Uh, how far reaching uh, Dirty Kansas is. Uh, several years ago, uh, Dan and his family were vacationing uh, down in Florida. And uh, Dan, being the cyclist that he is, you know, took his bike with him uh, on this family vacation down to Florida. And uh, one day he found himself in need of a couple more uh, inner tubes. And so he found a local bike shop and uh, went in to purchase. Uh, some inner tubes and a uh, 15 year old kid was behind, behind the counter at the cash register helping Dan and uh, Dan pulled out uh, I think a credit card and, and, a, and a license uh, a driver's license to, to make this purchase and this young kid noticed uh, that Dan had a Kansas uh, driver's license and uh, he asked Dan and says, hey, do you know, uh, you're from Kansas, do you know about the Dirty Kansas? And this 15-year-old kid proceeded to brag to Dan about his best friend who had uh, been to Dirty Kansas and had finished somewhere around 25th overall and uh, had no idea that he was talking to a four-time overall champion of Dirty <laughs> and uh, Dan very graciously just allowed this young boy to carry on and brag about his friend and never once let on that uh, he was a four-time uh, champion. But, uh, you know, here Dan was uh, all the way down in Florida and uh, runs into people who know about Dirty Cans. I got cornered last year at an economic development conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and 
I, I was expecting to get questions about um, tax credits and some other things. And it was a group and they were from Oregon. And they didn't want to talk to tax credits. They were sure that I could get them into the DJ. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, so you, you're from Emporia, you know, those people, right? Yeah. Well, can you get me in the race? And I'm like, We've known each other for five seconds now, and probably not, but keep trying. <laughs> uh, I do have one more story, if we have time for me to, me to tell this. Uh, recently, uh, uh, our hospital here in town uh, uh, had a, va uh, a vacancy come up for uh, an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, so they're now faced with the task of uh, trying to uh, recruit an orthopedic surgeon to move to Emporia, Kansas. And uh, I think uh, the, from the story I'm told, uh, they pro they kind of figured that this was going to be a two to three year process of trying to find somebody and, and convince them uh, to move uh, to Emporia. Uh, and uh, so part of this process, of course, is to uh, get a couple of headhunters involved in trying to find candidates. And uh, just so happens that uh, one of these recruiters, uh, the very first call he made uh, was to uh, an orthopedic surgeon uh, in West Virginia. And uh, he begins uh, to tell this prospective candidate of this wonderful opportunity in this really nice uh, little Midwestern town that you've probably never heard of. And oh, by the way, they have this really cool bike race there. And this candidate said, uh, oh, are you talking about uh, Emporia, Kansas and the Dirty Kansas? And the headhunter said, yeah, how do you know about it? He said, well, I've uh, ridden in that race three times. Uh, well, long story short, uh, this gentleman is our new orthopedic surgeon in Emporia, Kansas. <laughs> and uh, he jumped at the opportunity to move here because of Dirty Kansas. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that where people can live anywhere, right? They can they can find a job anywhere. And if you can be, if you love gravel road riding, if it's in your blood and you can be 10 minutes from it all the time and it inexpensive to live here, there's good jobs. It's a, it's a high quality of life community. Um, so you can live life here and not live it stuck in a car, um, trying to commute two hours to work that would take you 10 minutes and work. Yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. Thank you guys uh, so much. Um, we're looking forward to heading out there this year. <laughs> yeah, it's been great to have you. So thanks again for joining us for another episode of PLP Talks. And if you guys enjoyed this content, be sure to consider supporting the show and the channel. All the information is in the YouTube description or on the show notes of the podcast itself. And if you can't financially support the show, that's cool. We get it. But go to your podcast app of choice and be sure to leave a rating and review. It really helps the show gain visibility, more a bigger audience, and will hopefully help us attract some ad dollars in the future. So I hope you enjoy the show. And until next time, keep the supple side down.